Hey, this is Digital by Computing. Today we're gonna to be talking about security and the best practices that I would recommend you to put into your IT infrastructure, into your technology to improve on your security hardening and improve your security footprint. My name is Emilia, I work in the IT industry and I absolutely love it. And today we're gonna to be talking about security, specifically cyber security. Cyber security is an area that every single business, every single business owner, every single person in IT needs to be aware of and be taking it very, very seriously. In a world where cyber security risk and you know people trying to infiltrate, attack, hackers coming in, data being leaked out of businesses, it's imperative that you put the right systems in place to prevent these risks from happening. We want to mitigate risks. We want to prevent these things from happening before they occur. Once data gets leaked out of a business, it could have significant impact, financial impact to a business. In some cases, businesses need to be made, need to make public uh, data that has been leaked out of businesses. The last thing that you want is for somebody to be able to get into your system, into your network, and wreak havoc on your network, potentially bringing down systems, hurting productivity, and you having financial loss. So we're gonna to touch on a number of different categories. These categories are ranging from a number of different infrastructure technologies, and each of these will contain a number of security recommendations uh, that you can be putting in place to improve on your security and help you with mitigating risk. Server security is something that is imperative for every single business. Even if you have one server, a hundred servers, or thousands of servers, you need to be putting these things into place to improve on your security hardening and your security of your service. Set up a domain and Active Directory. Active Directory is a Microsoft tool that lets you manage and control all of your computers on a network. This includes your workstations as well as your servers. Your servers need to be controlled, need to be mitigated from risk through this tool called Active Directory. So Active Directory essentially is the foundation for a lot of other security practices that we're gonna be talking about throughout this video. We can't implement adequate patching. We can't add, you know, implement adequate policies around password expirations and security lockouts unless we have Active Directory as the foundation. So Active Directory is going to essentially manage all of your servers in one centralized location to be able to control and you know, push out policies and make sure that they're all standardized and simplified across your network. With Active Directory in place, you then need to make sure that your servers are bound to AD. This is essentially having your servers not running standalone, but actually communicating into the Active Directory infrastructure. Servers communicate to AD so that AD now knows about those servers and then you can go and control those servers through Active Directory, push out pol policies, make sure that the um, that the passwords are expired, making sure that you've got you know resets, uh, lockout screens, you've got security warnings on your screen when you log into a server. Look at limiting or removing internet access for your servers. There's no real good reason that a server should need to go and access the internet. I log into a server, I open up a browser, I shouldn't be able to go and browse the internet. Browsing the internet essentially opens up that server to vulnerability and you could download a malicious piece of software, malicious piece of code directly onto a server. You don't even have to go via a workstation via a laptop or a desktop if your server has direct access out onto the internet. Uh, there are some cases where some servers may need access to the internet. For example, a patching server or a server that needs to download certain pieces of software or updates from the internet directly, but they're generally going to be the exception and they're generally going to be isolated and controlled well enough that they are isolated from your internal network and there are procedures in place to protect that server from any intrusion into the rest of your network. Control access to those servers remotely. So in some instances, you may need to be able to access a server from outside of your office. Um, you may be able to terminal server into it to control it, make an update, and then you go. Um, this is not a good practice to have uh, by having something like RDP or VNC open on a server. 
you've essentially exposed your server out onto the internet for anybody to be able to snoop and see what is going on. The best thing you can do is set up something like a VPN, which is a trusted tunnel, it's a secure tunnel between your home, for example, and your office, you VPN in, and then from there you can get into the server. There is easy ways for people to be able to snoop on your network, snoop across the internet, across domain names, and figure out, oh look, this domain name is active, let's see what's listening on these ports. If they can scan it, and if they see that the RDP port is open, they will try and they will try and they can continually brute force try to crack the password uh, and the last thing you want is somebody to be able to get into the server uh, through a remote service. Look at setting a five minute lockout policy on a server. Uh, if a server is idle for at least five minutes, have it locked. Uh, there's no reason that a server needs to be logged in or, or accessible 24-7. If you need to access the server, if you need to control into the server, where it would be through a, a virtualization technology and you're opening up the console, through an iDRAC, through a uh, you know, RDP into a server, you should always, always, always have to put in your credentials to log in. Don't leave it open. Because anybody can literally just snoop in, they just connect into the server, and if it's already logged in and it's not locked, they've got full access into that server. So get that five minute policy implemented. It's imperative that if you have servers in your organization that those servers are backed up. Servers need to be backed up. They contain business data, business systems, customer information that is imperative for that business to operate. So if you lose the data, you could be in trouble, right? So make sure that you've got those servers backed up and that they are backed up regularly. Additionally, make sure that those server backups are sent off site. There's no point in having servers backed up and those backups residing in the same building as the servers, and then your server room catches fire, your building burns down or there's flooding or something like this happens, and then you've essentially lost your servers and you've lost the backups of those servers. So get those backups sent off site. They could be sent off to an alternate site, even to somebody's home or into the cloud, where there are cloud services for managing those backups. But get those backups off site and get them done regularly, preferably on a daily basis to a secure off site location. Ensure that your servers are regularly patched. Companies such as Microsoft, for example, that will release patches every single month to your Microsoft Windows Server fleet. Microsoft release these patches for good reason. They have identified that there are vulnerabilities on your servers, on the particular operating system of the server. So that will release security patches and updates to fix these vulnerabilities. Look at limiting or controlling the local administrator um, credentials on a server. So if your server is bound to Active Directory, then it's likely that the server itself also has an active local admin account. The local admin account is nice if you need to be able to access the server uh, by not using the AD credentials. But the problem is a lot of businesses neglect how important it is for this password, this local administrator account, to be routinely monitored, checked and controlled. This is talking about resetting that password from time to time, making sure that the password is complex and making sure that this password is not the same across all of your servers. Furthermore, some people will say, look at disabling the local admin password altogether if your server is bound to AD. This has its pros and cons. I personally don't prefer to do this because if you do have issues with connecting to AD, then you could potentially be locked out of your server. So look at putting the right practices and policies in place, in place around that local admin. Limit your DAs and your EAs. These are your domain admins and your enterprise admins. Only the right people should have access to a domain administrator or an enterprise admin. You shouldn't be giving out this privilege to just anybody. Uh, this is essentially full access privilege to your entire Active Directory and, any, and anything connected into it. So give this permission sparingly. It shouldn't be given to every person in IT. It shouldn't be given to every service account. Use it sparingly. Only give it to a small handful of people that really, really need it. If you have file servers or file shares or folders out on your network, ensure that you've got adequate security and permissions in place across those files and folders. Don't just have it all open. If you have a file server that is accessible by everybody in the business, 
that's not a good practice to have. So different folders, different departments, HR should only be able to access HR, but finance should not be able to access HR, for example, and HR should not be able to access finance. Good example, uh, your marketing department shouldn't be able to go into your finance folder and see everybody's pay. So look at putting the right systems in place, the right permissions, against files and folders. We discussed the EAs and the DAs, the enterprise admins and the domain admins. These are very high level privileges. It's a good practice to have that anybody who uses a system from an IT administrative perspective should probably have two accounts. One that has the, you know, the relevant domain admin slash enterprise admin permissions if they need that. And the other account would be another standard administrator account that has access to other systems. Not every server should need to be accessed by a domain admin. You could access other servers through a standard admin account. Look at disabling earlier versions of SMB, in this case, SMB version one, protocol for file sharing that is unsecure. Newer protocols have superseded this and are now already implemented and in use across your servers. So there's no need to be using SMB version one. Look at disabling earlier versions of SSL and even early versions of TLS. Similar to the SMB, the SSL and TLS earlier versions are legacy now. They have security vulnerabilities that have been thought and, and, and found out. So there are newer versions of TLS, newer versions of, T, of TLS security in place that supersede these earlier versions. So you don't need to be using these earlier versions anymore. Look at putting a system in place to monitor your DHCP logs. From time to time, it's good to go into DHCP and see what's going on review logs and see what computers have been getting allocated IP addresses. If there are unknown computers or unknown MAC addresses that have been detected in your DHCP logs, it could mean that somebody has been allocated an IP that you did not authorize. Somebody could be plugging into the network and they've just been given an IP and you don't know who this person is. So just put into a good routine to go into DHCP and see what's going on. Use trusted certificates on external facing servers. If you've got a server that is web facing, that is for example, hosting a website, get that server with a trusted, like a trusted certificate from a certificate authority. Don't use self-signed certs for external facing sites. Use the HTTPS protocol with a secure certificate attached to it from a trusted security advisor. Remove legacy operating systems. There are, similar to what we talked about, patching of uh, Microsoft servers, uh, Windows 2003 is, is a legacy server. That server no longer exists. You can't get 2003 anymore. So Microsoft will not release patches for server 2003 which means if you're running legacy operating systems, then those operating systems are essentially open and vulnerable to attack. There's no reason to be running older operating systems. If you do have software running that can only run on these older ones, look at upgrading the software or look at changing software vendors because that software could be putting your servers at risk if you, if you are running an older version of Microsoft Windows or any other flavor of server architecture. So that is a summary of server security recommendations that you can be putting in place. A lot of stuff that we've talked about and a lot of more things that you could add to that list, but that gives you a good overall foundation for improving on your security footprint. The end user computers and the end users themselves, you need to be putting things in place around their security, putting the right practices to improve on the security hardening of their systems and the education of your staff themselves. The scary statistic is that up to 40% of data breaches, data leakage, and malicious content coming into a network is that it's triggered primarily from the end user. The end user doing something they shouldn't have, doing things by mistake, and sometimes even intentional. So putting the right systems and procedures in place around your end user computers and making sure that they know what they're doing from a security perspective to make sure that your system is secure is imperative. Workstations and computers need to be bound to Active Directory, to AD. So you need to have an Active Directory system in place first on a server side to be able to get your computers talking to AD. Essentially, AD is going to let you control and manage all of your workstations from one centralized location. You can then push out policies and procedures out to all of your fleet of computers around security hardening, looking at you know setting up passwords, locking screensavers, um, and, and a number of other things to be able to manage it all from one centralized location through Active Directory is imperative. 
Computers should not be running standalone unless they are centrally managed from one single location through AD. User passwords need to be set to expire. There's no good reason why a user's passwords should be set to never expire. This is a huge security risk and a security concern. Implementing something like a 60 or a 90 day reset policy across your passwords is imperative. This can be done through a system such as group policy by Active Directory. Along with password expiration is making sure that those passwords are complex. So putting in complex procedures on those passwords, that they have to be a certain character length, that they have to be both uppercase and lowercase, they have to contain a number and they have to contain a special character. Having those in place are uh, the elementary component to making sure that the passwords are secure, making sure that passwords are not reused, making sure that passwords are not easy, so they're not simple dictionary, um, you know, simple words. So putting these things in place along with password expiration ensures that your passwords are more secure. Look at setting a five minute lockout policy on a computer. So this is done generally via a screensaver that automatically locks the computer after five minutes or that they have, you know, a user has to put in their password to be able to get in. You don't want computers out on the floor to be open. Anybody can just go in snoop and access the computer without any, you know, without any issue. So put in a five minute lockout policy against every workstation. Removing staff as local administrators is uh, something that is easily overlooked, but something that is very, very important. If a user is a local administrator, they have full access to their system. They can go and change registry settings, they can go and install any sort of software, including malicious software unintentionally from the internet. Removing that privilege can gives you more control. Users should be able to access their computer and do what they need to do to have their to, you know, to do their work, to do their day-to-day -day job, but shouldn't have full administrative access to their own computer. As soon as a staff member leaves an organization and they're terminated, get their account disabled straight away. Not just their Active Directory account, but every account that they've got, disable it straight away. You don't want staff that have now left the business to still have active accounts within your business. Implement regular security patching across all of the computers on your network. You know, companies such as Microsoft and Apple, that will release patches regularly, generally on a monthly by month basis, that are security fixes, patches, for vulnerabilities that have been discovered on the operating systems and on the software. So getting systems in place to make sure that patches are pushed out at least every you know, month, every two, every three, every six months, whatever it may be, regularly enough to make sure that your systems are secure and free from risk of any security vulnerabilities. Look at encrypting the hard drives within your computers. Now, this is something that a lot of people overlook sometimes, but if a computer is lost or stolen, the hard drive inside the computer can still be opened up, can be taken out, plugged into a USB hard drive or a USB case, and plugged into a USB drive, and then they've got access to that full computer's hard drive. They can see the file structure, they can access the files and folders quite easily. Of course, you can have a password on your computer. If your computer gets stolen, somebody powers on your computer and they're prompted for a password, that's not secure enough. They still can access it by taking the hard drive out and still see the files unless it is encrypted. If it's encrypted, then they cannot do that. Look at disabling the guest account on workstations. There's no good reason this account is even enabled. Enabling this lets people just be able to go in and log into the computer and just poke around. So disable the guest account unless, unless, unless it's needed because it has maybe it's a shared computer or it's used by customers or guests who do come in. Otherwise, disable that account. Limit control or block USB drive access on USB ports on computers. This is something that can be overlooked quite easily, but it's, it's important as well. Um, you don't want people, guests, customers, contractors, anybody in your network to be able to go in and just plug in any device into a, into a USB port. Doing that can introduce malicious software onto your computer, can also install software onto a computer to be able to scan the network and get information and steal data off a network. Uh, this is the same with your staff. Do you want your staff to be able to plug in their own personal device and take data out? This is security breaches. So look at controlling 
uh, the access to USB ports on those computers. If you do need them for um, you know, USB keyboards and mice, that can still be enabled, but you just disable access from a USB drive. Look at limiting or controlling BYO devices. Bring your own devices. These are devices that staff can bring themselves from their home, whether it be a laptop, a another sort of computer, or even a phone. This is something that is their own personal computer bringing, coming in and bringing anything into your network. You don't know what's on those computers. You don't know what they could be introducing into your network. If they have some malicious software, if they have a virus on their computer, they plug into your network, it could spread throughout your whole network. There are systems in place to control that, uh, to put good practices in place around device management of BYO devices. Uh, if you don't want to look at going down that route, then perhaps look at banning those devices altogether and, have, and having company data, company inf infrastructure and company computers only. Put a good practice in place to not store business data on the end user computers. Have systems in place that they can store data on servers and work directly off a server, whether that be a personal home drive, like an H drive, or directly on other servers, on other shares, but don't store data locally on your computer unless you really need to, unless you have backup systems in place to back up the data off the computer to a server, there's no need to have data residing on the computer. The computer is a tool to be able to access servers and shares and drives and work directly off those because those systems are backed up, those systems are secure. Get endpoint protection installed on every single computer. This is gonna protect you from viruses, from spyware, uh, any other sort of malicious software that may be installed onto a computer. Getting this software installed, controlled across all of your fleet is imperative. Furthermore, ensure that this software, that these endpoint protection software is regularly updated. It's got the latest definitions being downloaded automatically, however long they, you know, however often they get released, making sure that the scans are done regularly as well, that perhaps every night a scan is done, making sure that the scans are done across every file that is open, any file that is added to the computer and opened up, it scans it before it actually does open it up. Look at enforcing two-factor authentication across certain systems and certain services. So this is if somebody wants to access a particular system, they're prompted to use two different types of um, credentials to be able to access that computer. Sometimes using just one single password is not enough. If that password is compromised, then somebody has full access into this particular system. So you can put a second factor of authentication to be able to access the system, such as a pin code being sent to a phone, such as using an authenticated application on your phone that gives you a code, or even like a token. Something like this to be able to access your system requires a password and also a second form factor authentication or a code or something similar. Look at retiring legacy end of life operating systems and software. This is software that no longer is supported. Vendors such as Microsoft and Apple, for example, will not release updates for software that is no longer supported. So software that is now end of life and is legacy. That puts the business at risk. So make sure that any earlier versions of operating systems, such as Windows XP, is no longer in use because it can no longer be patched. Get everything upgraded or replaced to a newer version of an operating system and any newer, any older software is upgraded to newer versions of software. Many security breaches are actually initiated from your staff themselves. Staff education is imperative. Whether this is staff trained internally, whether they're sent off site, whether if it's communicated via emails or internal meetings, get your staff trained up and aware of security concerns out in the IT and out in the business industries. So that is an overview of the end user and workstation security. Good recommendations and good practices that you can be putting in place. Highly recommend them because your security footprint, your security is going to be improved significantly by implementing and enforcing these recommendations. Let's talk about network and firewall security. Some good practices, some good policies and systems that you can be putting in place to improve on your security hardening and footprint across networks and firewalls. Implement a business grade firewall. This is imperative. Unless you have a business grade firewall, a firewall that has enough security built into it, there's really no point in having a firewall. Do not use a home router firewall as your primary firewall. Get something that is more secure, that has the right procedures so you can go in and actually manipulate the content of the firewall and put proper 
you know, processes and controls in place around a business grade firewall. Get adequate monitoring software systems in place to monitor your entire network not just your network devices, but also your servers and your storage and perhaps even your software. This is system software that ensures that your systems are running optimally, that you know the health of your system, that you know when data has been breached, that you know when systems are running unhealthy, you can prevent attacks, you can prevent systems from failing by having adequate monitoring in place. Ensure that all of your systems are routing via a firewall. If you've got a server, a computer, a network switch, anything, make sure that it is going via a firewall before it goes out onto the internet. There's no point in having a firewall in place if systems can access the internet directly without any control of through a firewall. The firewall needs to control that access coming in and out of your network, so everything needs to be routed through that firewall. If there are external facing services or you need servers that need to be externally internet facing, get them into a DMZ or a DMZ zone. This is a zone that is secure, that needs to be set up to be completely isolated from your internal network. The systems and servers in this DMZ zone can be exposed out onto the internet, should not contain you know, business critical data because they do have internet, you know, they're right internet facing, but they should be completely isolated from your internal network. If you have a firewall in place that is business grade, look at controlling the ports that are opened on that firewall. Don't have any, any rules. From point A to point B, make sure only the relevant ports are open. If you have a server here and a server here, they need to communicate over a particular port, have only that port open. Close everything else. Do never, will never ever use any, any rules. If you need to access port 3389 for RDP, have only that port open, don't have other ports open. So control what ports are open on firewalls. Put adequate systems and procedures in place to control who gets access and what gets access into your network. You don't want people to just be able to walk around your office, contractors, customers, anybody just walking off the street, coming into your office, plugging into a network point on the wall, in a meeting room, anywhere, and access your network. They could introduce content that you do not want, malicious content that spreads through your network. They could also snoop your network, get information about your network, see data, see your IP ranges, all of these sort of things. So put systems in place to control access into a network. Don't let anybody to just be able to plug in and get access. Similar to that is implementing adequate Wi-Fi security. Don't have your Wi-Fi open for anybody to use. Wi-Fi should be controlled via preferably over Active Directory, so that you need AD credentials to be able to actually access your Wi-Fi. Um, Wi-Fi should not be given out. If you have a password for your Wi-Fi, it should not be given out to anybody because anybody could literally just access your entire network by connecting into your Wi-Fi. Uh, they connect into your Wi-Fi and they can see your network, they introduce malicious software and you want to limit and control that. If you do need customers or contractors to be able to access your Wi-Fi when in your office, look at setting up a guest Wi-Fi that is completely isolated from your other Wi-Fi and from your internal network. If you have unmanaged switches, switches that don't have any smarts behind them, they're called dumb switches, remove them and replace them with managed switches. Managed switches have more control over what the ports can do, more security about what those ports can do, uh, while an unmanaged switch can't. Anybody could just plug into an unmanaged switch and gets access into your network. A managed switch, you can control exactly who and what the user can access via the ports on those managed switches. Look at setting up a uh, web proxy. This is something that um, your user needs to go through to be able to access the internet. So all of your computers are routed, your servers, everything is routed through this proxy. This proxy controls what access somebody has out onto the internet. You can block sites, so content that you do not want staff to be able to view. You can also control the amount of time that staff have access onto the internet. You can actually get reports to show you how long somebody has been spending on YouTube or on Facebook or similar. So put in a web proxy, improves the security, make sure that you can only access sites that are approved by the business. So that is my network and firewall security. A good list to start off with, a good foundation, a lot more that we can talk about, but I hope you found this helpful. 
talk about some basic email protection security recommendations that you can be putting in place. Make sure that you've got proper backups in place for your emails. You've probably got servers out on your fleet. Uh, those getting backed up is great. Make sure that you get your email systems also backed up regularly. Whether you've got on-premise email, such as something like Exchange, get that backed up. But if you do have cloud-based email, such as the, you know, the G Suite, the Google Suite, or the Office 365 Suite up in the cloud, get backup systems in place to ensure the security of that software, the security of those emails. If they get lost, you can actually restore that email to wherever it may need to be. Get additional email filtration and protection systems in place for your email. Some of these email systems already have some basic filters already out of the box that can control what emails come in to your network. But put in further email filtration systems to improve on that um, email flow. That is imperative. Uh, emails can still come in, malicious emails can still come in. So you need a adequate enterprise grade email filtration system in between your email system and the internet to be able to scan those emails and block out emails that do not need to be coming into a network. Control and disable certain attachment types on emails. Attachments such as executable files. Files that can be double clicked from an attachment. Somebody may not even know what that attachment is if they double click on it and they introduce malicious software into your network. There is a broad list. There's a list of uh, you know up to 100 extensions, file extensions that you can block to control what comes in and out of your emails. You don't want to be able to allow any form of attachment to be able to be sent and received from emails. Any of these emails could contain malicious code, malicious software that could be detrimental into your network and your network health. Look at disabling URLs, you know, hyperlinks in emails themselves. Uh, if an email is sent with a link, somebody clicks on that link, you don't know where it's going. You know, it may say www.microsoft.com, but in the back end, it's actually going to some malicious website. You don't even know. Uh, so look at just disabling those, those hyperlinks altogether so that when they come in the email, it's just text. And so somebody has to manually copy and paste that text into a uh, search bar in a browser if they need to access it. Because clicking it, you don't know where it could be going. And it's just a good security procedure practice to have in place. So that is email security. A lot of stuff we can talk about. This is a brief summary and uh, let's go on to the next one. Let's think about hardware and infrastructure. These are good procedures you can be putting in place to improve your hardware security, your infrastructure security, and things such as your server rooms, your data centers, those sort of things. Secure your server room access, your comms cabinet access, your data center access. You don't want your servers, your switches, your network equipment just sitting in the corner of an office outside of any sort of protection. Anybody could just walk around get access to it, take things out, introduce things into your network you don't want. Have those in a cabinet. Have that cabinet locked. There's no point in having a door on there with a key if it's not locked. Make sure that that key is given only to the right people. If you have a server room, have that server room locked. If it's a data center, have the proper controls in place to access that data center. You can do this via keys, via scannable fobs, uh, make sure that, that the server physical infrastructure is not accessible by people who shouldn't be accessing it. Hardware that is end of life should be decommissioned. Hardware that is end of life is um, no longer under support. Parts often cannot be uh, acqu you know, acquired from the vendor. So if you have parts that fail, you can no longer get it. As well as that, the hardware itself does have software loaded onto it, such as firmware, that can no longer be updated because the hardware vendor no longer you know, supplies that software for that hardware. So hardware that is now end of life should be replaced with hardware that is within life. Look at controlling your mobile devices. So let's talk about mobile phones and tablets, those sort of things. Um, if you want people to be able to use their own personal phone, to be able to install your email, your corporate company email, that's fine, but put proper controls in place to be able to manage and control that. Uh, further to that, you can actually have mobile device management, they're called MDM solutions in place, 
to control your entire suite, look at systems, you can actually put security you know, profiles directly into devices, you can remote wipe devices if they get stolen you know, to lack from data from being breached out of your business, but look at controlling your mobile devices. Ensure that your hardware and your infrastructure assets are securely disposed. So often people just throw out old hardware, throw out, you know, throw out old desktops and laptops straight into the bin. They end up in landfill and anywhere from, from your office to that landfill and even in landfill, anybody can just get access to it. They could be sold off to wherever and they still contain your data on the hard drives. The hard drives will contain your data that you do not want to get breached out onto your out into the world. So put systems in place to securely wipe that data. You can, you can organize with third-party companies to do this. You can have shredders that can actually destroy the data adequately. Ensure that all of your assets, your hardware and your infrastructure is tracked and controlled through some sort of asset management system. You want to know where your hardware is at all times, who the hardware is allocated to, if it's physically in this building, in this building, in what size of the building, if it's located in a particular data center, uh, you want to have perhaps you know barcode system with your name on it, something that is easily trackable. That if I go and have a look at any piece of infrastructure, I can see a code on there. I can look up that code and I know exactly what that is, where it is, who it's located, uh, who, who it's assigned to as well. Across all of your hardware and infrastructure get some sort of a legal notice to be displayed on the screen before somebody logs in. This could be your end user computers, this could be your servers, this could be you accessing a switch. As soon as somebody logs in, or at least turns it on, they're prompted with a security warning that says, you know, by using this system, you are agreeing to our acceptable use policy. Any breach of this will have X, Y consequences. Get that in place so that anybody who accesses any system, any infrastructure piece of system in your organization is well aware of the risk so that if they do breach any IT accessible use policy, they should have known better. Ensure that your hardware firmware is up to date as well. Uh, software is released frequently. Ensure that your hardware firmware is up to date. Underlying in most hardware, there is some sort of software running the, the hardware components themselves, get that hardware up to date with the latest versions of software and firmware. They will contain security fixes and updates, so making sure that your hardware is up to date from a firmware level is also very important. So there you've got an overview of hardware and infrastructure security recommendations. A lot of good foundational stuff that you can be putting in place. So apart from all of that, there's also a few good processes that you can be putting in place in your organization to ensure that things are running smoothly, to make sure that things are documented and understood in the event of disaster, in the event of data breaches, in the event of security risk. The first is the BCP, a business continuity plan. This is a document that outlines what happens to your business in the event of a disaster? What happens to HR? What happens to finance? What happens to your marketing department if a disaster was to happen? If your building is damaged, if it's flooded, if there's fire, if there's a cybersecurity risk, where do you meet? Does your business continue to operate at an alternate location? What do you do to be able to restore operations? You need to have a BCP. Along with the BCP is the DRP, the Disaster Recovery Plan. The DRP will focus primarily just on the technology component. It will work hand in hand with the BCP, but will focus on the IT systems, the backups, and what procedures you need to put in place to be able to restore operations. Who in your IT department is going to be involved? What third party vendors, ISPs, you're gonna be working with to be able to restore your IT technical systems to fully functional operations. So there you have it. They are the security recommendations that I would recommend you to be putting in place. These form a good foundation. There is a lot more that we can also talk about, but this is just really a starting point for every single business to be implementing uh, and improving on your security footprint. I would love it if you commented and also write me if you have any comments. I would love to have a dialogue with you and subscribe to my channel. There's a lot of other videos that I do have on my channel around a lot of different technology topics. Love it if you commented. We'll see you next time and have a good day. So if you found that video helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel, Digital by Computing, just on the button there for more videos.